welcome everyone to GeoHug. So firstly, I just wanted to say how thankful I am for everyone for their kindness and support this year. I've had an absolute blast running GeoHug. So I just really hope that it's brought you a little bit of joy and that you've got some value out of some of the talks that we've presented. Uh, so yes, thank you everybody. And so our last rock star for 2020 is Mark Bennett and Stephanie Blauberg. And Mark is the executive chairman of S2 Resources. Steffi is a geologist up in Finland. Uh, so Mark spun uh, S2 out of serious resources when it was taken over by IGO for $1.8 billion. He's the only individual two-time recipient of the AMEC Prospector of the Year Award. So I'm so stoked that he's joined us today uh, to take us on a journey to the home of Santa. Uh, so he'll give us a glimpse at the unknown and untapped mineral potential of Lapland in the far Arctic north of Finland. Uh, so S2 Resources is exploring for gold and base metals 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. So thank you so much, both of you, for joining. I know it's early and dark up there, Steffi, so thank you so much. Uh, and, yeah, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Yeah. Um, no, when, when, when you mentioned the, uh, the Christmas version of this, I thought, what better than to go to Lapland, which which hosts the little town of Robin Yemi, which is the official home of Santa. And Steffi's up in a place called uh, uh, Levy uh, or Circa, which is a bit north of there, but I think you're about 200 k's north of the Arctic Circle at the moment, Steffi. Yeah, pretty much. And um, I have seen it's been nice and cold outside. I mean, just a little chilly, minus 20, just a little bit colder, I guess, and comparing to your end of the world. and. Just yeah. a normal day. <laughs> so yeah, it's cold and dark there. Uh, you won't see the sun for a while. We're just going to give you a little sort of fairly light uh, version of uh, what we think about Lapland and why S2 is there. And I see we've got Matty on online and he's from the GTK, which is the Geological Survey of Finland. So he'll be keeping us honest and um, We've got Marcus Storbman, one of our employees as well. So he, he'll be keeping us honest too. And when we talk about our little gold prospect called Arne Valkia, um, he's the one who came up with the name, which apparently according to Google means fire in the woods, marking the site of buried fairy gold. So let's hope it's true. But I'm gonna put the presentation up. I'm gonna do the first half, which is the easy bit. And then I'll hand over to Steffi to talk about what we're doing up there and, uh, and so on, and then we'll, we'll circle back. Yeah, okay, that's a photo uh, in winter, um, at when the sun is at, it, at its height, and uh, it gets pretty dark and cold up there, a bit different to uh, where I am right now, which is Western Australia. And I'll just skip through that usual corporate bump about uh, disclosure and everything, and I'll go into the Good bit. So what I'm going to talk about, and forgive me those of you who know a lot about Lapland, but it's it's I guess it's for those who don't. So where where it even is, what it's like being there, why S2 is there, and and I'll talk about its mineral endowment and its exploration history and the potential for finding more, and what we're actually doing there and how we can sort of capitalise on that, and how we actually go about it. And Steffi will talk about how we actually work up there and use our little Arne Valkyrie gold prospect as, as an example, which is a, a sort of virgin gold discovery un underneath cover. So it's just taken a while to load. So firstly, where is it? Um, that's where we are, where the red circle is. And it's in the far north of Finland. And Lapland sort of crosses several countries. It, it's a sort of region that predates nations, I guess and it covers Northern Norway, Sweden, Finland, and parts of Russia. And it might be surprising to people who aren't familiar with the geography up here, but we're, we're way north of Moscow and St. Petersburg um, and Helsinki. We're about a thousand kilometers north of Helsinki and only 520 kilometers from the, the, uh, the Russian nuclear submarine base at Murmansk. So we're closer to the Russian nuclear submarine base than Perth is to Kalgoorlie. Uh, to put you on scale. Uh, so it's an interesting part of the world. Um, 
and it varies a lot. So being north of the Arctic Circle in summer, you get very long days and sometimes the sun doesn't even set. Um, and this is a bit what it looks like. So it can be pretty warm. Uh, when I was up there helping Steffi collect soil samples, I think it was 32 degrees one day, believe it or not. Um, but there's lots of pine forests, lots of lakes, uh, plenty of rivers, lots of swamps and lots of mosquitoes in the summer as well, a bit like Northern Canada. And plenty of bush tuckers, blueberries, clabberries, salmon, uh, plenty of reindeer and, and even bears. And, uh, you know, at the height of summer, you get pretty well 24 hour daylight or just a little bit of twilight. And that uh, photo bottom left is one of our guys, Andy Thompson, going about his work. It's easier to walk along the rivers sometimes than it is to try and walk through the forest. Um, so it's a pretty nice spot. But in winter, it's quite different. So in winter, it, minus 30 isn't unusual. You get deep snow and you can get 24 hour darkness at the height of winter. And I think that's what Steffi's in right now. And if you're lucky, you might see the Northern Lights, although I've never seen them, uh, but some of our guys have. Uh, and that, that photo top right is, is one of our drill rigs drilling in the snow in winter. Um, where we're based, we we're lucky in that the, the town we're based in is actually a ski resort. And that's the hotel on top of the mountain there at, at the bottom right, where they have a conference every two years for, for the mining industry. And down the bottom of the hill is Circa Town, which is the uh, sort of uh, nicely sort of lit up uh, Christmas scene in that photo there. So it's a pretty good place to work, uh, albeit climatically extreme. And then I mentioned earlier, there's a town called Rovniemi, which is the official home of Santa Claus and quite a lot of people fly into here just to, uh, to visit it at Christmas from other European countries. And uh, there's even a, an, an overnight sleeper train from Robin Yemi to Helsinki called the Santa Claus Express with a, with a bar on board, which is pretty good too. So I urge all of you, if, even if you're not working in Finland, you should go there. Um, so, but why are we there? Obviously, you know, we're a mining company. We can't just go and ski and fish and things like that. We actually have to be there for a real reason. And we're there because it's an area where there's a lot of uh, mineralization and it's a, a good place to work. So S2 only works in places where it thinks it can find big deposits and where uh, they're sensible places to work and, and not, not sort of uh, dodgy places with all sorts of issues. So Lapland has a, a tier one gold deposit and a tier one base metal deposit, but surprisingly little modern exploration. The majors have been in there, but the sort of hungry junior explorers that, that are common in Canada and Australia haven't really hit this place as hard yet. There's a few Canadians there, and I think we've, we're almost the only Australian company there. So lots of potential and relatively little systematic exploration in modern times means there's, there's a lot of uh, potential to find things. And we've got a big ground holding, so that's a good, good exploration opportunity for us. And the reason we like being there as well is it's, you know, it's a first world country. It's number one on the, or usually number one on the Fraser Institute worldwide ranking. So it's got good laws, good social structure, good political framework, long history of mining, great infrastructure, despite being 200 days north of the Arctic Circle. There's sealed roads, hydroelectric power lines, 4G coverage. It's actually better than being in the suburbs of Perth infrastructure wise. Um, and, a, and a, a workforce, uh, local towns and everything. So it, it's a good place to explore. And just talking about the gold, for example, this is a photo of the, what's, what's called the Surikusiko or Kitala gold mine, which is owned by the Canadian company called Agnico Eagle. Um, it's best part of 10 million ounces. It produces about 160,000 ounces a year at an all in sustaining cost of about $600. So it's a really good quality mine and it's probably the biggest operating gold mine in Europe. But unless you're in Finland or maybe Toronto, you, you've never heard of it. Um, so it's a bit of a sleeper. And when you look at the distribution of gold deposit sizes in any greenstone belt, you normally get a typical curve like shown in those graphs there in either the Abitibi or in Australia. But until recently, Lapland has only had one big deposit 
and none others. So either Kittler is a freak or the others haven't been found yet. And we think the others haven't been found yet. And as a little company or not so little company now called Rupert Resources is finding, there are more to be found. They've just made a, a good looking discovery. Um, so we think there's gold there to be had and we're out there looking for it. And similarly on the base metal front, you know, our previous company, we found the Nova Bollinger deposit. Um, Anglo-American discovered a deposit called Sakati, which Steffi actually worked on. Um, and if you look at the, the value of the metal content of this, this is the equivalent of two or three Novas. So it's a definite tier one base metal deposit. Um, and we're sure there are more of these to be found as well. Now that one's currently, well, it's a while ago now, but 45 million tons at the best part of 2% copper, 1% nickel plus cobalt, platinum, palladium and gold. Um, so there's good reason to be there looking. This is what the area is like in terms of tenure. So our tenure there is the sort of bright uh, turquoisey blue color. Uh, and there's a bunch of other players there. They're mainly either majors, uh, mid-tier Canadian gold producers or uh, uh, Vancouver listed explorers. And so there's ourselves, there's Agnico Eagle, Anglo-American, Boliden, B2 Gold, Kinross, and then in the juniors, Orion, Firefox, Rupert, Magnus, Anna Kanan, um, Strategic, uh, and ourselves. So the belt's largely stitched up and we got in there early and, and have about 20% of it, which is a good spot to be. And probably the latest excitement here with that green label down the bottom, the, the Akari prospect. So Rupert Resources have only recently discovered this and that's some of the hits they're getting. 167 metres at 4.2 grams gold, 158 at 4.3, 63 at 6.4. So this is really the, the latest, hottest news from there. And, and that's a good example of, of why we're there. Um, so where we are, basically within that red circle there are, are our gold focused leases. And you'll see Arna Valkia labeled there, which Steffi will talk about in more detail. And then down to the south in, in the green circle is uh, our ground position for the base metal exploration. So having set the scene, um, what I'm gonna, gonna do is hand over to Steffi now and she's gonna talk through the rest of the um, presentation. <laughs> Hello, yes, thank you very much, Mark. So yeah, as Mark men mentioned, how do we actually explore in Lapland? And as he said, the, the geological survey provides a lot of open access data. It has an excellent database that is accessible for every company who, who wants to come to Finland and explore. So there's um, great regional surveys done the geochemist, as we're highlighting here in the presentation, you see the, the magnetic airborne response in, in grayscale, and we have overlaid it also with the, the regional gravity also flown by the geological survey. And combining these, these data sets, just to identify strategic stratigraphy and structures and yeah showing you potential areas where you want to go and explore and um, again the government data also provides um, yeah a big uh, big open data set for geochemistry that has been completed over the whole country and yeah all of that combined uh, we use as a regional approach to yeah pretty much um, put licenses on the ground and if we go to the next slide there is again one of our examples then how do we find our fairy gold in the north and you see on the right is one of our license areas that had a east-west extension of over 15 kilometers and it's pretty much all undercover uh, there's a extensive blanket of uh, glacier teal um, concealing most of the bedrock. I mean, outcrop up here in the north can be as little as 2%. And in our case, we applied uh, the method called ionic leach. I'm not sure how familiar you are with it, but it's, it's a little bit an unconventional soil sampling. It's 
very important to take a sample from the same horizon every time you take it, no matter what your, uh, your soil horizon you are in. So it doesn't matter if you're in A, B or C, and it's a, a very sensitive high-tech method. And it's a really like low, well, fairly low effort sampling technique. So over one summer, we have taken over 10,000 samples in our license areas. And as you can see again on the map to the right, from this big 15 kilometer east-west extent with the, the soil sampling program, we managed to narrow down um, a corridor that helped us to define yeah, our further exploration methods. And if we come to the next slide, if we, as Mark mentioned in our exploration efforts, we are also looking for nickel copper PGE deposits. And um, we have done electromagnetic surveys on the ground and also a VTEM survey with the helicopter. And in one of our target areas that you see here on the map in, in Ruapas, which has the, the VTEM, um, I would assume it's the set channel in the back. And this area has an, no formational conductors that we have identified to this stage. So pretty much every anomaly on that map is a viable target to be followed up with, with further exploration. And how do we follow up on these regional soil sampling programs or the geophysics we have completed from helicopter based or on the ground? So if, if we have a look at the next slide, there is a very neat system in Finland that is called base of till sampling. So we, we have this little machine on the left. I hope you can see that well. It's a, it's a really small, like a track mounted uh, vehicle, partly like the military uses some of those or used to use some of those vehicles as well. And, um, it's like a small tractor and has a small uh, drill on the back of it. And um, <clears throat> it would be some kind of an equivalent to an uh, air core or RB rig, but you just get a, a one single sample. It is uh, like a small diameter drill rig that has a flow through sampler. So what you get is the last 30 centimeter of of your drill profile. And with this rig, you can, I mean, I've seen it going down to 25, maybe even 30 meters in, in cases, but this is helping you to see through the, the till cover and um, in, I mean, depending on your, your ground and how rocky your till layers are. But uh, in most cases, you're actually able to reach your bedrock and it, it chips off the actual like in situ bedrock from the from the ground and you get that in your sample as well which as a geologist is really handy to look at so you can create your own more detailed geological map and you do get the essay results from the sample as well and um, we don't have a big uh, weathering profile up here in the north so you get very little dispersion on in your glacier till. So even if you might not reach bedrock, but you get close, you still will see the anomalies in your, in your sample. And this is a really light, light vehicle. And in, in most cases, you can do this all year round, definitely in the forests and um, some of the wet areas. But um, if you have this, I mean, up here in the north, we have very wide swamp and bog areas. So there are limits, of course, to it that can be done, yeah, only in the winter. And again, this method helped us in, in our exploration work to narrow down this wider corridor of several kilometers to just really find a drill target and the in situ gold anomalies that helped us to define the drill locations. So if you go to the next slide, we just have again um, an example of the drilling that we do to follow up on our geophysics and surface geochem anomalies. 
there's pretty much no uh, sea drilling happening in Finland and yeah, pretty much no availability. So the only way to test your anomalies here is with a diamond drill rig, even as a first pass, um, first phase drilling program. And I know that usually in Australia, we do this probably with RC or air core, but there are definitely advantages for using the diamond drill rig straight away. So our rigs are you again, track mounted, so you can very easily move them around in forested areas. And yeah, as you can see on the pictures, you can use them all year round. It doesn't matter in the winter or in the summer. Um, again, for us, the winter when it's frozen and snow covered has the big advantages that we can go on the very wet grounds, the swamps and partially even on the lakes, which you obviously can't access in the summer. But we have so much dry forest ground as well, as you can see on the left. And um, so it's really nicely isolated, small drill rigs that keep you warm in the winter and help you to protect from the rain in the summer that can be yeah, quite, quite a lot. It's not always as Mark said, he got uh, very lucky to have a very warm summer here when it was really plus 30 degrees. And it can be quite tough working in the forest at those temperatures. Um, if we come to the next slide, we just zoom in into our Arnie Valkia prospect. And um, as Mark said, so the, the name, yeah, stands for a, a guiding light or a fire that is existing in nature and can mark spot of uh, buried fairy gold or buried treasures. And you see again the um, the map with the, the base data in the back, the magnetics, and um, you can see, I'm not sure if it comes out very clearly, but all these little dots on the left side is from our base of TIL program that narrowed down really this mineralized horizon that you can see on the right. And um, <clears throat> I guess it gets very small to see some, some of our grades, but we, we identified several mineralized shells and really lately in one of the latest drill holes, we drilled just now in October, uh, one of the highlights was nearly seven meters at over 11 grams of gold. And that even extended our whole mineralized zone another 100 meters away from what, the, what we had already identified towards the West. And um, so this really opened up our target area for Arnie Valkia. And we can have a look at a section on the, on the next slide just to to show you the, the different lenses and um, some of the grades. I hope you can, can read this as well. As I said, the, the hole that you see on the most Eastern side is just the one that I mentioned. And um, then you can see, as, as it says, there's 110 meters from the previously intersected mineralization. And um, yeah, so if we just... Just I'm not sure how we're doing for time, but um, just on the next slide as well, we have a nice picture how this mineralization actually looks like in drill core. And you see this beautiful um, arsenopyrite uh, quartz veining, albite, sericite alteration. And um, it looked absolutely fantastic when it came out of the ground in, in drill core and when we, we, when we were cutting it. And, um, it yeah, just confirmed these, what is it, like seven meter that nearly 12 grams and even four meters at 18 grams. And it's st still all fairly shallow, as you can see, like 223 meters. And as we see from the section, it it literally sub under the, the tail cover. And just to show you again, the, the mineralized envelopes in the in a different direction on the next slide. So literally just what we want to show here is that there's the potential is still there. The whole deposit is still open in, in various directions. And um, we are planning for 2021 to definitely follow this one up again with another drill program. And um, 
Yes, I think just to sum everything up that the, the methods that we have applied for our exploration led to a really new greenfields discovery in the Northern Lapland Greenstone Belt. And we started off with a really wide prospective area that was more than 15 kilometers in east-west direction. And we, we narrowed it down to nearly two kilometers by soil sampling and followed up with our base of till um, drill program to identify drill targets. And, um, if we come to pretty much the last slide, just to show you again, uh, uh, surface view of the drilling that, that we have completed. And as we said, our latest step out really opened up the the body to the east and as you can see we still have untested base of till anomalies also to the southeast uh, sorry southwest and yeah we are really looking forward to to continue our exploration in this target and also looking for more nickel copper potential in one of our other targets during the next year and this winter and I think that would be pretty much it from from our side with a very brief overview of the work that we have done and um, we just wanted to say thank you to our team from Australia and everybody who's based in in Europe Andy Thompson and John Bartlett Marcus Staubmann John Carrier um, Johan van Dell he is in Belgium he is a geologist who was on every stage of our drilling program. Matthew Good, who's also currently in Australia, but worked here for several years. And Lisa Repo, who is currently working with me on our exploration efforts here in Lapland. So yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, yeah, if you have questions for myself or Mark, just fire away. Thank you. We have had some coming through. Um, do you use downhole geophysics? And also, what is the host rock of the gold zones? We, we haven't used downhole geophysics for our gold project here. We would definitely use it for the, the nickel copper exploration if we do diamond drilling. And it's something that's been, been done in the past. And um, yeah, in terms of the the host for the the gold in our Anivalkia project, so we have um, um, rock units that are mafic volcanics, um, felsic volcanics, and um, like felsic porphyries, um, and these are sitting on an, a shear zone that runs through them, which clearly shows. Uh, a very nice, as I said, like an, an albite, sericide alteration. You see strong shearing in places and you have the arsenopyrite pyrite as a sulfide phase as well. Um, um, are they protozoic greenstone belts? Do they look like West Africa? Where does, what is the metamorphic grade? Uh, yeah. Um, Funny you should ask that. So yes, they're Proterozoic. The, the geology is very much like the Proterozoic Beryllian rocks of West Africa. And what struck me and one of the reasons we like it as S2 up here is um, I worked in West Africa in, in the mid nineties throughout the Proterozoic Beryllian and the rocks and the, the alteration and the mineralization is very similar. Uh, but also the thing that struck me is when I was in West Africa, it was just the Ashanti Obwasi gold mine and very little else. And a whole bunch of Canadian juniors as first movers into that province. Uh, and you look at West Africa now, and it's one of the big sort of gold producing districts of, of, of the world with uh, explorers having come in and found the missing, missing gaps in that, that size chart, if you like, and what, that really reminds me of, uh, of Lapland now in that you've got the same sort of Proterozoic greenstone belt, same style of mineralization. Funnily enough, you've got a bunch of Canadian juniors as, as sort of first movers. Uh, so it, it sort of looks like a, an embryonic version of West Africa to me. 
Um, do you see attenuation of surface geochemistry with deep till versus shallow till? I have seen and um, the, the geological survey and also partly um, Otto Kumpo at the time, uh, they have done several surveys uh, with till sampling and also have done or trying to take a sample reaching the bedrock and then trying to take a sample higher up in the till. Again, it can vary a lot how many till layers you have. So yeah, there can be quite a difference in in your response in your analytical response from when you actually do reach bedrock towards if you get stuck or if you take a sample on a till layer that is higher up but as we said because the weathering profile is quite quite low or just not not much there you you don't get that much dispersion but you do get some dispersion so it is a really a question of is it one till layer versus several till layers um, I assume that exploring in Lapland is simply application of the successful approaches applied in Canada. Are there any differences other than geology? Um, I don't think so. Uh, one difference I've noticed is you know, Australians are used to working undercover and they're used to starting wide and, and zeroing, zeroing in in a staged manner. And uh, a lot of times in the past, I think people have gone in and, and got focused very quickly. Whereas adopting that sort of out in approach and being a bit more patient, I think gives you a different result as, as we've shown. There have been other Australian companies that have gone into Finland and bought assets <coughs> and tried to improve on them. Uh, whereas we've quite deliberately adopted a greenfields approach and just started as if it's a, a blank canvas and, and not been biased by uh, being too knowledgeable, uh, sometimes being being a bit dumb is good, and uh, and that's exactly what we did in this case with Arna Valkyrie. You know, we started off with a blank canvas, went through each stage patiently, and and, and did that. And I've I've just found in the past because I worked in Canada as well. Often in Canada, because of the the way the mineral title is, in that you get small smaller uh, tenements, or you know, the, you, you're forced to focus in very quickly and you don't have much room to operate in whereas in Australia we're used to having lots of room to operate in and, and adopt that different approach so that's one sort of difference in mentality I think. Um, How's Santa going to get, get get here if the borders are closed Mark? <laughs> <laughs> it was said in Rovaniemi and um, in Finland that the uh, Santa passed all the tests and he has all the permissions from all the countries despite uh, COVID. He can visit all the countries. So oh, there should fantastic. be no. I wouldn't trust Rudolph though. <laughs> no, that, uh, that nose is a little hint. Uh, he should definitely go for another test, I would say. Wonderful. Thank you. Awesome talks. That was awesome. Um, do you mind terribly showing us outside? <laughs> no, I don't. Um, yes, as we as we said before, at the moment there is a lovely minus twenty degrees outside, and the sun went below the horizon on the eleventh of December, and is only going to come back up again. <gasps> New Year's Eve, and it again started to snow. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, so you're trying to keep the road clear, but they will still be covered with snow and ice in, in most places up here in the north. That is so beautiful. So you can easily get 10... Wow. Yeah. Is that your sauna, <laughs> Steffi? But <laughs> that is actually our little fire hut in the yard. Um, so when it gets really cold, we go there, light a fire, and uh, do the barbie kind of inside. Excellent. Oh, my goodness. Well, I hope everyone has had a great time. Thank you so much, Steffi and Mark. That was so awesome. 
see some snow and learn all about what you're up to. So thank you so much for the time. And it was so, yeah, honestly, thank you everyone for the support. It's been an absolute blast. We'll be back in 2021. But yes, everyone have the best holidays, stay safe, and I'll see you again soon. Yeah, ho, ho, ho. Thanks, Jess. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jess. 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 Thank you, Jess.